Fuck. All right, let's we're rolling. Rolling. Planet B presents presents Cult and Culture Podcast. This is episode thirty-one of the Cult and Culture Podcast. Season. Wait, we don't have seasons here in California. Or um, hurricanes. <laughs> I'm Justin Pearson. I'm Luke Hinshaw. He's on mushrooms. We're psyched about this episode here. It has uh, my longtime friend, <laughs> Jose Palafox. Uh, man. Great he, dude. Yeah. He, well, he was in a couple bands with me, Struggle, Swing Kids. Um, I met him when I was 13 or 14 at a PIL concert. And I think the next day I saw him at the swap meet, Colby swap meet, where his uncle owned a stand selling bootleg cassettes and T-shirts. And... Those were the best. Yeah, actually, his stand turned into Music Trader, which is really kind of weird. Yeah, which is now gone. Wow. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, I had a, I got a, I got my first like kind of job there, aside from like paper route stuff. But yeah, I got a job there, and then we became friends. He ended up switching to Mission Bay High School where I went, and we started a band. And I'm surprised that both him and I are still alive. Um, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, That's um, awesome, dude. Yeah, he's such a great person, such a crazy ass drummer. Unlike no other drummers, um, I mean, he's a jazz drummer, one of the few that I've really played with. But he would like do this crazy shit where he'd like freak out and leave during a song, yeah, and then he'd come back, like punch his drums a couple times, and then finish <laughs> the song. It was like the craziest shit. Dope. Um, yeah. I do want to apologize in advance for the uh, video quality of this episode and the technical difficulties that we did face before this podcast, and it almost did not happen. But thankfully, with Jose's patience and his calmness, he, uh, we kind of got it together. Yeah. It was weird. We just found out Paul Rubens died, too. Mm-hmm. That was like really Yeah, just minutes before. Such a fucking sad thing. That, yeah. Um. So anyhow, I'm psyched that he was on this. Um, we did a, a, a brief Colton Culture um, volume, which was before the podcast with him. That was was pretty awesome, too. Um, but this is like the full one where we dove into a conversation. I, I really wasn't sure where it was going to go. And where it went is very surprising mm-hmm. because it's really not specific to music, but also can be applied to probably every single musician and artist that we know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, we got a special guest that came in towards the end. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, what did Jose call him? High tech Aztec. <laughs> yeah, the special guest is great too. Also, awesome friend and family. Um, so yeah, it's cool. It's cool to have like just someone drop by that. Yeah. Makes it makes sense. It was awesome to have everybody on board. Yeah. If anybody was gonna stop by at that episode, it was gonna be him. <laughs> yeah, the high tech Aztec. Yeah. Um, cool. So. We'll just uh, cut out here and let, and like dive into this um, podcast and um, check out Jose's work. I mean, obviously, Struggle and Swing Kids, but Botter Brains, uh, Bread and Circuits, Yafet Koto. He was in a bunch of crazy, awesome bands, and um, he is doing a lot of great social work. Um, so, yeah, if you end up seeing him anywhere, um, tell him what's up. Give him a hug. He's an awesome human being. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Later. So my name is Jose Palafox. I'm a drummer, I'm an educator, and also work in mental health. I live in Oakland, California. I'm gonna be fucking 50 years old <laughs> in December. <laughs> yeah. Um, you wanna talk about the awesome bands that you've been in? Oh. Just list them off. Well, I've done a few different bands. Mission Bay High School <laughs> is the first one, I should know, with Mr. Vinoli. Uh, who we used to crank call while we were in high school all the fucking time. And yeah. I feel really bad about it. Yeah. Sorry, but, Mr. Um, Vanoli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, Struggle, Swing Kids, Bread and Circuits, uh, played a bit in Yafit Koto, Butter Brains, um, played sometimes in Tit Wrench, cra- r- Crash Worship, um, Both Hands Broken, probably a few other ones I can't remember. You did that short chunk of touring with some girls which is pretty rad that's right yeah i did do yeah. that yeah um so 
we've been friends for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we met at the swap meet. Yeah. Uh, your uncle hired That's me right. to sell bootlegs. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Bootleg tapes? Uh, yeah. Tapes, yeah, and oh, t-shirts. Yeah. Nice. They had they had good shit. Um, <laughs> and then we and then we like officially met at that PIL concert right. and hung out. And then we were inseparable from then. With Jesse. Yep. Jesse Who Roach. Away. Yes. R.I.P. Um, fuck. What was I gonna say? So, uh-huh. it. I think the uh, the stars were you know aligned and we were destined to be um, brothers yeah. somehow. It's been yeah. fucking crazy. So we have so much shit that we could talk about, right. but we're gonna narrow this down to hopefully one massive topic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I want to start off by saying there was this time where mm-hmm. I think we were. It was before struggle and and um we were both going to Mission Bay High School, I think, or maybe not. Anyhow, we, we went to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3, and you were on acid. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was 14, uh-huh. and so you were maybe 15. 15. And um, you were on acid, and my mom got drunk and couldn't pick us up. And so we <laughs> were trying to get home, and the cops picked us up. And they fucked with us. First of all, they were like, are you guys skinheads? And I was like, okay, there's a few things here. <laughs> Jose has this giant mohawk, and I had a Dead Kennedys Nazi right. Punks fuck off T-shirt. Right. And then like, okay, you're not skinheads, are you fags? And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> that's the obvious thing for a cop to Hello. say. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, can you just give us a ride home? And they and they were um, not cooperating, and they mm. wouldn't give us a fucking ride home. Right. <laughs> and right. I was like, we're two minors. Right. It's you know midnight, and they wouldn't give us a ride home. And you're on acid, but um, so we ended up walking from the sports arena to claremont it took us a long time Damn. yeah holy shit yeah. i don't remember yeah. that it took, obviously it took I was on acid. fucking forever. Right. i know it's funny to go see texas chains on massacre <laughs> on three i had not done acid yet so i was like are you sure you should do that if i had done acid i'd probably been like dude let's go see a normal movie because this is not a fucking good idea wow um but with all that being said like i think that it's no wonder why we uh and I see, I say this in like a, a loving right. term, but like we're fucked up, and yeah. like we've been fucked up, and I yeah. and all the things that the that this world has um, dealt us. And I'm not pitying us, but I'm just saying right. like us in the like specifically the punk community, right. we all have these things where it's like this happened and this right. happened, this happened. No mm-hmm. wonder we're into weird shit. No right. wonder we are struggling. Right. Um, right. Mentally, I, mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about this kind of platform that it allows people to not be victims but to be uh survivors and more importantly to be resilient Mm. to bounce back from shit that's hard you know and i think that for some of us that's our only way to survive is to be part of something that's bigger than us Mm. and i i could speak for Mm. myself punk rock has definitely saved my life because it was something that was bigger than me and it allowed me to put my body where my mind told me to and to actually embody it in every fiber of my body and I still live the same way and to me it's not just the music but it's the it's the practice of how we relate with one another and for me that was really important you know I I was born in Tijuana I grew up in San Diego so even being part of the scene here you're my brother i love you we connected but there was still something that i was not part of i wasn't part of this country i didn't look like most of the kids i went to shows so i still felt like an outsider even Mm -hmm. though i was part of this subculture um and it's not been until recently that we've been able to have more of an awareness Mm -hmm. that even with its subcultures Mm -hmm. there's even more subcultures within and I think that I'm just grateful that I was able to be part of this scene where people can allow that diversity that would be aware to stuff like that. Yeah. You know, do you think maybe in San Diego there was there was a, a no, it's never enough because punk and hardcore right. was always centered on white men. Mm. But there was like a lot of, you know, there was a mm. lot of Latinx kids that were yeah, part of sure. all the bands and stuff. I mean, obviously because of the regional right. uh, location. So right. I mean, there's that, but it's never. It was never enough, and it was never recognized or addressed, right, in a serious manner. I mean, there was the time when right. Unbroken played to right. all those straight edge kids, and you introduced them in Spanish, <laughs> and I think the entire audience had no idea what you were saying. Right. I think Rob Moran was the only one that was right. like, "Oh, you're calling everybody white devils," and like, <laughs> I just remember you and Rob laughing, and everyone else being like, "What? Are the, what's right. happening?" Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it. it and last night. I, don't, I forget his fucking name because I've known him, seen him at shows for decades. This this black dude, 
Um, he was there last night, and I was like, I just wanted to let you know, bro. It was fucking amazing to see you at that show, the Unbroken show mm -hmm. that was last night at the Che Cafe. And it was just good to see you amongst all the other kids in there and just you being in there and just taking up space mm -hmm. the way that, for example, Chicks Up Front in D.C. Mm -hmm. took up space amongst the white straight edge kids. Yeah. It was it was just great to see that body, that person having fun, enjoying himself and being part of that. You know, I saw that. I identified with that and I just let him know that I really appreciated him. Yeah. Still being here. Sure. So. so what were you gonna say? No, I said it's dope. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a huge shift here, though. But like, and I, I think Dave Claiborne mentioned it about mm. all of the people that have passed mm. um, in the last like right few years. It's yeah. pretty insane. And and you know, recently Rick Froberg passing w w was pretty. Um, sub it's very substantial. But yeah. um, and he and he passed for other reasons. But a lot of a lot of people in our lives have, mm. have taken their lives um, due to mental illness. I think that's something um, but to, to, to be, to, to, um, I don't know, to recognize and mm -hmm. to, and to mention, I think it's right. wild because I, I, it was weird seeing like people crying and shit, you know, because I mean, I'm broken's missing Eric Allen, but there's all these other people that passed away. And it was weird because you know, it was like um, every time Unbroken played, for me, it was sort of like um, a memorial to Eric right. or to other people. And it was really nice that, you know, for instance, Dave would include Gabe Serbian. And, right. and it made sense. And it was fucking crazy. I, I feel for those people mm. um, that, that left us and mm. I feel for their family. Um, I, I was know. just talking to Luke about that when we mm -hmm. were setting up for the shit. Um, Last night at the at the show, uh, I hadn't talked to some people in decades, and they were like, "What the fuck are you doing?" You know, I introduced my wife, living in Oakland now. We have a beautiful house. Um, I love the field that I'm in now. I was in academia. I, I used to teach Latinx studies, sociology. I was at a, amazing places where I was teaching at, but I went at a different career and I went into behavioral mental health, um, which is where I'm at now. Um, and so as I was telling people, people started kind of telling me their shit with their family, with their partners. And it, it just, to me, it was beautiful, but it was also, it shows that we still have a long way to go in terms of destigmatizing issues around addiction and mental illness, even within our communities, right? There were bands like The Cramps, like remember that video that they had in that fucking, uh, the, yeah. like that was amazing yeah. on so many levels. The psych ward uh, right, show, yeah. To yeah. like, connect identify with that but i think still there's still a lot of stigma so when people bring it up and it's so obvious that it just kind of forces us to address those issues that even within our community i think it's still taboo i still i still think we don't we don't talk about it as much mm -hmm. we don't address it as much i mean i think maybe the fact that we are into such str you know, it's pretty strange stuff on a mainstream level. Yeah. Um, maybe attract, maybe it, we're attracted to it right. because it feels it's it, a good reference point. Is that mm. cramps video? Because, and I think even Lux has been quoted saying like, "These are people that really did enjoy it." You know, right. and th whatever it is, their brain is wired <laughs> to like really right. be driven towards right, that. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so they're performing their disability, if you will. The audience. Yeah. Yeah. It, but 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 felt comfortable I think yeah. and 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 the fact that they were respected right. enough to have like this cool ass band they were yeah. fucking cool yeah. come there and do it for them that's right. something yeah, that yeah, says yeah, something yeah. but so in you know I I think about that like I, I wonder you know with Eric and also with Gabe it's like man I wish they would have just said something everybody loves them you know and but it's something that that we can't um, I don't think we can like necessarily change the trajectory of what their life I think. Here's the deal, and I haven't really talked about it much publicly, so I feel okay talking about it with you guys, and hopefully somebody can learn something from this. But um, I was straightish for a long time. I was straight, and uh, for a while I became really depressed. I became really anxious, and so I started self-medicating with stimulants and alcohol. And I'll be, I'll be honest, like alcohol saved my life. It prevented me from blowing out my fucking brains out when I was sad. After a while, alcohol stopped working and it actually started making things worse. So I had to figure out a way to address that shit 
without something that was actually not helping. It was actually making it worse. So that's when I got into recovery and I did it the way it worked for me, which is through traditional abstinence based, you know, 12 step model, which was weird because it's all God centric and it's everything against that I believed in, in terms of authority, in terms of religion, in terms of all that shit. But I remember one of my guys that I used to work with early in, in AA, he said, AA works for people who believe in God, for people who don't believe in God. It just doesn't work for people who think they are God. And here I am quoting like Karl Marx, like religion is the opium of the masses, uh -huh. yet fucking opium was my religion and I thought I was free. And so I had to really come to terms that like, I am not free, I am a fucking slave. And if you really look at the word addiction in Latin, in terms of the etymology of the word addiction, it means to be bound to, to be a slave. So I was almost a slave to, to the stimulants and to the alcohol. And so in order for me to get some freedom from all of that, I had to be aware that I was a slave. I had to surrender and say, hey, bro, I need fucking help. I can't do this on my own. And for me, it wasn't God. It was G.O.D., group of drunks, other people who were like me, who like called me, took me to a mm -hmm. meeting, like hung out with me. And so that allowed for me to grow as a person and address the shit that led me to the alcohol. The alcohol was not the problem. That was the solution to the problem. Sure. So I had to address the shit that led me to that. So that I got into medication, started exercising, started, you know, doing the shit that we need to do to be healthy, getting a good night's sleep, eat mm -hmm. healthy, exercise, you know, be social. And I started getting better and I and I, you know, I'm coming up on thirteen years being clean and sober. Mm. And that's all because of uh, a, a sort of DIY uh, community that people support each other that are anonymous and that it's not about, you know, we just support each other in a mutual aid kind of way. And there's a lot of similarities between the punk community and the recovery community. I'm actually writing on that book. I still want to do mm. for 3-1-G. Cool. <laughs> cool. But I, I really see a lot. And, and in fact, Bill W., one of the co-founders mm. of Alcoholics Anonymous, would always say that Alcoholics Anonymous is an anarchist organization. Cool. We have no fucking leaders. No one runs this shit. It's run by people who believe that you don't have to fuck people over to survive, mm. right? And and I really I really dug it. And so I've just been really blessed to, one, be better myself, and then be in a field where hopefully I get to be useful to someone else. I get to be of service. Every day I wake up and I just, I'm so grateful that I get to do that. You know? Do you think maybe, this might sound trivial, but do you think you have already been a service to people? Because for me, I'll, and I, I'm not, um, obviously in the same field that you mm -hmm. are academically mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. or um, career-wise, but uh -huh. like I'll go on tour and people will say, Swing Kids Saved My Life. Mm. And that's a crazy thing like to think about um, being a successful band. I mean, Swing Kids yeah. weren't monetarily successful, but right. the fact that I can go on tour and have not just one, but like right. many people say, your band Amazing. saved my life. Yeah. I but we didn't even so. know we were doing that. Right. Um, and I think for some of them, they could probably relate with the lyrics, but I think they can also relate with Eric. Also, just the sheer energy of the music, you know? I mean, it's just, it has a vibe, I think. Because lyrics, what was it? Like people, like Cliff, I think, in Struggle said oh. that um, the only effective form of communication is music, and, mm -hmm. it, and, it, and it doesn't have to be specific mm -hmm. to lyrics or, or language. It's, right. it's, a, it's just an energy. And right. it comes to the, like the punk right. and community world. Right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, I agree with punk that. And hardcore community. I'm I'm just really glad that um, I mean it's sad that Eric's not here. Yeah, it's a bummer. It's a big fucking bummer. Um, Mother Jones used to have a quote. She said, "You know, remember the dead, honor the dead, and fight like hell for the living." Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks in ACT UP used to use that mm -hmm. when they carry their um, the coffins. profession. Oh, right? they did the procession. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. And they they had that saying of like, these people are dead. But we're still alive and we're fighting like hell for the living. And I think Eric, even though he's not here, his message, his presence, his music, mm -hmm. I think is encouraging others to, to move forward. Um, it's really interesting because I also went through a very dark period where I almost was engaged in, you know, suicidal ideation. And um, I actually cut myself and I wasn't trying to kill myself. Someone asked me, like, were you trying to kill yourself? I was like, no, dude, like. I was actually trying to live. And he was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I was cutting so I can live because I didn't know any other way to deal with my emotional pain. Mm. 
And that's the same thing when people abuse alcohol or drugs, I feel, when they abuse it. Not when people recreationally use it and they don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with that. But when it becomes a problem in their lives, they're doing something that's repeatedly and compulsively despite negative consequences. That's the sort of definition of addiction. And when someone is cutting, they're not trying to kill themselves. They're just trying to live, but they don't know how to necessarily deal with all emotional shit. That I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> you trying to live like kind of like maybe by shocking yourself, like I'm, I'm fucking with the notion of death, kind of like I'm making myself aware that I I'm alive. I don't want to feel. When someone, when I drank and fucking mm -hmm. smoked meth and did all kinds of crazy shit, I did not want to feel. I was escaping from self. Yeah. Self is the problem. So cutting is a way to not feel by feeling that visceral. Like mm. physical. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, wonder I think if... many of us do that. Sure. It's just not in so many crazy ways. But when we engage in fucking over shopping or fucking, mm. you know whatever there's so many addictions but we focus on these ones because those are the ones that we fucking i mean we have like two million people in prison mm -hmm. right a good 65 to 70 percent of those are in there for non-violent drug offenses oh yeah people need fucking help they need treatment sure. they don't need fucking prison yeah but so much of that approach is not from a health perspective it's from a criminal justice perspective so we tend to vilify those with mental illness so a lot of people don't understand when someone's engaging in that like self mutilating behavior, mm. we just want to like put them in a psych ward or mm -hmm. give them some pills instead of really addressing like they're actually reflecting the craziness of the society. They sure, and and also, but them just getting locked up is also a uh, part of the whole yeah. prison industrial complex. Right. So and also considering race, that's another right. huge topic too. So yeah, I've been locked up myself in seventy two hour holds. Shit was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Shit was not fun. Um, well, I mean, you were famously locked up <laughs> on the cover of the struggle undertow. I know we were talking image. about that because undertow played yesterday, yeah. and I guess some people were coming up to uh, Pettybone and they're like, "That's a cool cover," and he was like telling them like, "No, dude, like that's Jose. That's the guy from that band. He actually got fucked up by the LEPD," and they were like, "Oh, wow." They thought like they just grabbed it from. I don't know. Yeah, somewhere. People, like, I mean, it was before the internet, so we couldn't like right, brag about right? it. <laughs> I always bragged about it. I was like, yeah. no one's drummer gets on the cover getting right. arrested by the LAPD. Yeah, and that was in the LA Times, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. cover. The yeah. fucking cover. It was also the cover of the Revolutionary Worker, but right. LA Times that. is a little bit more <laughs> mainstream. Um, but I wonder about like the, the, the stuff you're talking about, yeah. like the sort of negative um, reaction to life. Mm. Um, maybe ties into also into punk and like this nihilistic mm. kind of old school punk rock thing like the mm. the sort of Sid Vicious ishness of punk which I think is not necessarily a modern it's not re re it's not relevant in modern punk like we we I think we punk is tr at least trying to evolve mm. into something that doesn't really need that what I mean say more about it because I have some thoughts but well. I don't what what always comes up is you know Gigi Allen, but we can we can not discuss that necessarily. But I want to say like <clears throat> more like when people like okay, I grew up, I was obsessed with the Sex Pistols, and right. I always thought Sid Vicious was cool. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I was like, oh, actually, there's all these other things associated with the Sex Pistols that are cooler, like the lyrics and the art right. and stuff. It wasn't really about this like spiky haired leather jacket punk rock heroin addict with a swastika t shirt. Right. I, I get the shocking let's upset your parents kind of aspect or even the more severe stuff like being uh, a drug addict and, mm -hmm. and essentially, mm -hmm. you know, maybe killing your girlfriend and whatever. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Wow. But, <clears throat> okay. You know what I'm saying though? Yeah. Like, it, it, like he was like this weird poster boy for punk rock, which I, to me, I look at like, and I don't, this is no disrespect to the people that I do think is a poster boy, but like someone like Ian MacKay is someone that mm -hmm. you, you, you should more as a younger person look up to. And it was, it was when we went to see um, Pitchfork open for Fugazi. I, right. I, I, that night I realized like, oh my God, there's so much more right. depth to punk, not even like punk rock, but punk. And I was like, right. oh, there's this like, this sort of like moral code, this right. ethical code. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I I think that sometimes commercialism has a way of 
grabbing things and then selling it back to the kids and people tend to associate what it means by what they see as being presented as mm -hmm. what is punk mm -hmm. and that's always been like my beef with um some of the parts of punk rock which is um to me it's not really such just so much how you look and or the aesthetics of it or the presentation but it's it's how one lives their lives and how they relate to not just to other people but to the planet i mean fuck you know we're like we're seriously fucked right now yeah <laughs> planetary wise yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know um so to me i've seen a lot more people that engage in what i would call punk's praxis or punk's diy ethics that um have nothing to do with punk yeah but they embody it in the way they relate to other beings and to me that's much more important than someone who might present with certain ways aesthetics or nihilism um i just never really i never really got that i don't know but you, what do you mean you didn't get it i i I mean, I got it, but it wasn't like... I mean, I had a Dick, Dead Kennedy's Leather Dragon. I had a Mohawk and all that. But to me, after a while, that went away because it it doesn't really matter to me if I'm being an asshole and I'm being in a certain way, but I'm presenting myself as something that I'm not. And to me, I think that's what didn't allow for me to come out and talk about the shit that I was dealing with because... Like even in struggle, for example, we had certain lyrics, we had certain music, we presented at, as a certain political band, but the individuals, I will speak for myself, I was not healthy. And I think things aren't black and white. I think things are like a little <clears throat> mixed sometimes. And I feel that I just, I try to stay away from fundamentalisms from mm -hmm. the right or from the left. And I think we get a lot of fundamentalisms sometimes, even in DIY subcultures, mm -hmm. when things aren't that black and white. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does because, well, I also feel like maybe, and that's another thing too, is like, we kind of talked about this earlier, but like, I, I think everyone, and I'm not trying to diminish mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. or struggle or anybody in mm -hmm. but like, I think everyone has not just black and white. We all have that gray area where exactly. you're like, oh, this is, this is pretty wild. You know, it's, <laughs> It's weird too, like, I mean, I don't want to get too much into, mm -hmm. into punk and hardcore, but like when we would associate with certain bands, I, I would right. I would wonder why we are connecting to these other people. And in, and, and in retrospect, I, I sometimes it made sense, sometimes it was the wrong person. But there was mm. always like one person in a band that was, I don't know, just sort of like on the level that had a, a, an extra element of depth to them right. that we could fully connect with. For sure, um, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I definitely felt that. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about it now. I don't want to say what bands. Yeah, I don't. I was, <laughs> I was, I was trying to avoid that. No, you have to now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even like again, we could talk about uh, you know, Unbroken playing last night. Like that was another thing too, where it's like it was very special to people, but also to me and to like. I'm so close with all of them. Very close with Rob Moran, obviously, and just we. We've gone through more than I've gone through with the rest of Unbroken, but like just ha hearing Dave speak about stuff and just the way, just to talk to him, like on uh, off, you mm -hmm. know, uh, not mm -hmm. on stage, like mm -hmm. just in general, mm -hmm. like or Todd or Steve, like just to talk to them and mm -hmm. and like hear about just their humanity, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it's just fun. It's weird. It's it's weird because I remember growing up seeing them play in backyards, covering "God Save the Queen" <laughs> and shit, you know. And I'm like, oh, this is so weird. Right, right. But but you know, they they um, was, I guess steered clear of the of the those sort of like yeah. nihilistic punk rock things. Um, right, 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 right. I don't know. Yeah, I just wonder about what we've accomplished and and why, and also like what we've been up against. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting to think about. Well, here's the thing, JP. Like, I, I've thought about this because um, I think I'm going to be 50. I think that if I was to, for whatever fucking reason, die tomorrow, and I was to be so lucky that someone would write an obituary about me, I think more than likely, and I hope that people would remember what I did, not what I said. Because I think that so much of punk is about what you are vocalizing 
and and unfortunately so much is against is about what you're against not what you're for which is mm -hmm. a lot more challenging mm -hmm. to discuss anyone could be against fucking anything but what are you actually for that takes thinking mm -hmm. critical thinking reflection introspection it takes a lot of stuff but i hope people remember what i did and what i did is not so much public in terms of how i work with other people i don't want people to know what i'm doing in terms of when i'm helping other people uh on the dl because it's not about that it's about how i work in my community with the people that i know the people that i help and because in order for me to to keep my sobriety i have to help someone else a mm. helps b a gets better and mm. so i don't necessarily need to advertise what i'm fucking doing mm -hmm. but those people that know me and know what i do will know and so i hope that that speaks for action speak louder i feel and i think sometimes in punk we get too worked up about what we say versus what we actually fucking do in our lives not just in the music yeah that, and you know i agree but also maybe more so now too like if you've accomplished all this stuff and at some point like fucked up yeah the fuck up is the thing that people just <laughs> yeah you know? and it's unfortunate because i really do believe in redemption i do believe that people are not their worst mistakes people are not yeah their worst mistakes people can change people can um there's also a thing it, it is a mistake yeah but unfortunately mm -hmm. we uh we vilify people and and we and and that's because we put them on a pedestal but people are gonna fuck up and i think there's a big difference between shame and guilt shame says i am fucked up guilt says i fucked up i can work with fucked up because I have fucked up. The thing is, you make amends, you change mm -hmm. your behavior, you do something differently, and you move forward. Shame says, I am fucked up. I'm just fucked up. Everything's fucked up. What's the point of changing? And I think too much of the sort of call out culture, for example, tends to uh, uh, focus too much on mm -hmm. making someone this thing that they did mm -hmm. versus you've done that. How can we support you to grow and change? I wonder if like those two versions of being fucked up and fucking up are kind of equivalent to like let's say Sid Vicious and Ian Mackay. Yeah, you're you know because um, I do wonder like and, and not to talk about Sid uh -huh. Vicious because I think he's not that interesting, but like he, he, whatever got him to where he was, like, he's had I'm sure he had issues mm -hmm. like most of us do, but th those are the things that projected into that and right. And maybe that's the the core root of of punk. We 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 needed help, you know. Yeah. And um. Right. I mean, it was obvious to me last night. I was as again as I was telling Luke, like it was just felt cool to be able to say, "Hey, I work in mental health now. I work especially with folks who are challenged with addiction." And someone's like, "Oh, my brother's fucking up right now. I hope he shows up to the show. I want you to talk to him." Oh uh, yeah. Uh, just on and on and on, and it's just especially in our community of punk most of us have had some kind of trauma some kind of adversity while we were growing up and this is the thing that helped us at least for me survive and move forward but some of us were not lucky enough and we took our own lives mm -hmm. or we fucking moved to a really dark road yeah. you know a really dark path and um some of us are still there mm. and barely making it i wonder where empathy fits into the equation because I, I, I do think that maybe a lot of people are unempathetic mm. um, to others that are... Why do you think that is, though? Selfishness, I think. I mean... That's what I was I was wondering. How, yeah. how do you react yeah. to that? How did you react last night to somebody just coming up to you and saying, yeah. hey, my brother's fucking up. Like, yeah. Almost like... Right hear help him out him. or he yeah help like, him yeah maybe that, at, was a maybe that was maybe that desperation mm -hmm. yeah. yeah on his end but if somebody was like uh -huh. uh, like to me uh -huh. it would just have to be on a case-by-case -case basis right i would think right but you have seem to have a fucking hell of a lot more patience than i do <laughs> i have to have 50 well i don't have to but my work requires 50 minute sessions with clients mm -hmm. so i my approach to um counseling that's basically therapy. what this is yeah <laughs> it's basically like here's the here's the thing it's not that people don't want change it's that they resist being changed mm -hmm. the more you push someone the more they're gonna say fuck you 
and resist. So you have to ask questions in a way where they can see. So you, you point out their behavior. Their stated goal is this. I want to do this, right? I want to not fucking smoke crack, shoot fentanyl. I don't want to do any of that shit. Okay, what's your behavior doing? And so our job as counselors is just to point out the discrepancy, the ambivalence mm-hmm. between what they're actually saying and what they're actually doing. And for them to see, this is what they say they want, but this is what they're actually doing. So how can we support you in you making the decision to do it? Mm-hmm. The more I try to push them, the more they're gonna say, fuck you. Yeah. So my job is just to ask questions, to listen, to offer some support, both from lived experience, but also from my clinical. Um, to be empathetic. Well, that's mm-hmm. the first thing. That's before anything. But a lot so, of people miss that fucking so, first point. So there's two kind of clients that I've worked with that um, in, in drug treatment that uh, like fucking see the fakeness uh-huh. from a mile away. Mm-hmm. So I had to really learn. And that's high school kids, middle school kids who I work with. And then people who've done ex-lifers, people who've done serious prison time. They fucking smell that shit from a mile away. So the first thing I had to do is just establish rapport. Hmm. I'm not trying to fucking do anything. I'm just trying to listen, just trying to connect. Because if you can't connect, you can't do anything. Sure. And I feel when bands are able to do that, then you can fucking do whatever you want. Okay. (laughs) And but not you have to connect with them. But what about like this? This might be trivial in the broader spectrum of things. But like, what about like? And, I, and this is no disrespect to straight edge, but uh-huh. like a lot of straight edge bands are unempathetic. Like a good example right. would be I don't I fucking don't even know like st- like like the dumb straight edge bands. Like mm-hmm. I'm a, I shouldn't say dumb, but like the ones that are militant. Right. Wh- so so Maya Angelou said something that was very interesting a long time ago, or at least it's been attributed to her. She said people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I really try to embody that in my life. That's interesting. People don't fucking care or are going to remember your speech, but they'll fucking remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And I think that if you can connect with people on an emotional level, because there's a connection between memory and emotion, you're more than likely going to make an impact. So that person that asked me that shit yesterday, I was like, dude, I was in the same fucking place. I almost fucking died. This is what I did. And this is what really helped when this person helped me this way. It fucking helped a lot. You know? They're going to remember that. Then some fucking speech about some clinical medication or whatever mm. the thing. Those are important. I know about that. I know about different cognitive behavioral therapies. I know about different treatment modalities. But they're more than likely going to remember mm-hmm. an emotional connection. And I think that too many of these certain bands, they have an important message. But as you know, it's not just about content, but it's about form. Mm-hmm. Too many people focus on the content without remembering the form. The form is how you engage, how you relate, how you connect. So you could be the shittiest fucking um, um, aesthetically wise, but (laughs) you connect with someone on an emotional level. I'm like, I fucking dig that. I wonder like, cause I do think about like, and I I don't want to, I mean, I'm not trying to point this at me, but this happened a lot recently where now that there's um, this sort of awareness of people in the trans community, mm. I've had a lot of people come up and say Interesting. that the locust made them feel comfortable in the late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. mid 2000s, for oh. whatever reasons, mm-hmm. made us feel comfortable. And I, right. and I don't understand what that is that, mm. that brought in that comfort. What do you on think accident, that's about? Everything. I think the fact that we were weird as fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, I definitely think that the aesthetics. Just... It was an accident. <laughs> but all the morals were set it. up. All yeah. the ethics were set up from everything. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> you want to br- bring Carlos in? Carlitos! ¿Qué pasó, hermano? ¿Cómo estamos, loco? Look at you and your fucking guavallera over here. What's You're going to have to be in part of this podcast. <laughs> Side. Hey, man. Oh, my God. Come here. Good to see you, dude. Dude, look at you and all your fucking high-tech, high Aztec shit. <laughs> <laughs> Have a seat. Have a seat, bro. We're just finishing up the interview here. Nice, nice. So, I'm going to throw you into this real quick. Uh-huh. We we did this. The last Locust shows uh-huh. were with Sonido de la Frontera. Really? And it was really interesting. Fuck. It was really interesting because... It, 
I and this is I mean I mean this with all my heart. Like Sonido is a fucking punk band. Like you guys are, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Like it and and we played these. It was fucking it was like shit coffins. Sonido de la Frontera, The Locust. Uh-huh. Like that's beautiful, weird yeah. or therapy. Yeah. Um, Sonido de la Frontera yeah. and and The Locust and and people like. Um, reacted to it in yeah. the in the way they should. It was beautiful. Yeah. It was awesome. It was so cool. It redefined punk and made people realize that like punk isn't Sid Vicious. Right. It's something else. I think yeah. speaks to the region, right? Yeah. We're in the fucking frontera, and the frontera is not just a physical demarcation, but it's at every fucking city. It's at every school. It's at every fucking community where people are being divided by these fucking fake fronteras. And I think when you demarcate that with music. You're breaking down that shit. That's why I really loved about that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I've seen. I've been seeing those T-shirts. Like Cumbia is a new punk. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I want one yeah. of those. Yeah. It's true though, but it also is like cultural appropriation, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's a trip. Um, Def Club just went on tour with the with these bands. Um, n- no way. Um, we were the, I think we were probably the weirdo bunch, but we, you know, you have like the bumper music when you're done, right? right. P- they usually put on some garbage hardcore metal right. and we were like, no, 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 always put on Sonido every night after we're done. <laughs> and it was really, it, cause the contrast is beautiful, you know, just brutal, weird shit. And then cumbia and people are like, oh my gosh, I, like they feel free. And like, you just look out and you see people dancing. Usually it's people of color dancing and yeah. the white people are like, what the fuck? I, Here, here's know. what I did. I love that documentary and I know this might fucking get some people pissed off but i really fucking didn't like that that documentary on san diego punk Mm. did not include tj did not include a lot of the shit it's gonna blow Mm -hmm. yeah i'll defend um bill a little bit the director because how do you make a document you can't talk about everything in an hour not that excluding the our proximity to mexico is a is a justifiable thing but hmm. it missed out on gravity records it missed out on all kinds of stuff but you're making a documentary about san diego punk you could at least set set a sentence sure. or two yeah. about the ways in which Tijuana, the people from Tijuana, the people that are Mexican American, Chicano, Latinx, embody the scene. Yeah, I mean, you you just I I just think it was a big miss opportunity. Sure, and maybe that's a movie documentary for us to make for other people to yeah. make. But yeah. it's just I just feel so many so much of that history is left out mm. all the time. We have fucking Centro, we have Chicano Park, we have so much shit. You know, that's punk. It just doesn't work that way in terms of what people identify as punk. Again, going back to the stuff yeah. I was saying about punk praxis is not always the music, but it's the 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 way that one lives their lives. It's up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were talking about that earlier about mm-hmm. like punk isn't. I I always say there's a difference between punk and punk rock. Okay. Punk rock is the thing that you under you're just like yeah that's rancid or whatever. But mm-hmm. like punk taking away the musical aspect mm. it can be anything right it's, right, it's right, this right. ethical and moral code that that we i don't know somehow are embracing yeah mm-hmm. maybe not embracing i don't know yeah what's b-side doing these days um we leave tomorrow on a north pacific kind oh, of run uh, portland or a uh, seattle and then cross over to all the hippie mountains yeah they're, they're gonna let you through vessels. they're gonna let us through yeah. <laughs> Fuck, you guys get all your green cards and shit? Yeah. Okay, that's just up. Yeah. So once we're past, like, the L.A. checkpoint thing. <laughs> those but, motherfuckers are up on the mountain, dude. They're, like, I looking know. and shit. Yeah. Hey, but yeah. we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us, it's, motherfuckers. Yeah. I'm always scared. I mean, even when I was younger, I would come from Phoenix. They always thought I was Mexican. I was like, you motherfuckers? <laughs> They're like, yeah, it was weird. Because I was always out in the sun and, I guess, tan. Yeah. But, like, right. I was like, why am I... They always thought my parents had this Mexican kid in the car. Right. I'm like, what the fuck mm. is going on? Yeah. And, and my, it was weird. And so now it's like in me. I'm like, oh, we already get stopped. You yeah. Know? It's because you have a spalda <laughs> mojada. <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> what is, what does that mean? We can't say it. People will get offended. All right, I'll have to go well, ahead. I also yeah. believe in humor. I think that too many of, of us yeah. who have been political. I like Beaner. I like Right? Beaner <laughs> that is a little bit better. Because you, I don't know, bro. Like, that's the thing is like as a white person you can't fucking tell me how I'm gonna make sense of racist structures in our society like for me comedy is the way to fucking make sense of it sometimes totally and I laugh and, and it's funny to me so fuck you for being politically correct and telling me I can't make jokes like oh they're gonna go in the back of the trunk because they're Mexican you know yeah. shit like that yeah. and then 
and then shit like that and i'm just like that's just how i live bro yeah. like that's mm -hmm. that's the reality that but I it does live. make white people that uncomfortable. are comfortable um, they should fucking mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable sure <laughs> yeah um i uh <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they should they should they should i'm a fan of it i also think when i'm when i'm if you meet some fuckhead nazi you know or right. neo-nazi but you being like oh. you're a fucking neo-nazi they're gonna be like yeah but instead love, if you can if you can combat them with some sort of I don't know I always talk about that this time I, I engaged with uh, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan on Facebook shit. and on it was Facebook crazy. yeah and we everyone was trashing him and I'm like fuck this is bad he's gonna shoot me when I go uh, to um, uh, Tennessee next or whatever this is I don't want to like talk some shit to this guy and on the side we ended up talking about Dave Chappelle and he uh, and he brought up how he thinks Dave Chappelle was the best um, comedian ever and he cited that. Um, that skit where he was oh, the blind clansman right, right, and right, it is right. the fucking funniest thing <laughs> yeah. and I was like dude that's crazy and not that I felt um, like I was relating to this Klu Klux yeah. Klan dra Grand Dragon like the purple one right, you know right, I was, like, right. uh, I was just like um, the purple one yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey I, I love me some fucking Tennessee Texas clansman cause you know where the fuck those motherfuckers are these yeah. tech, uh, California racist oh yeah they're hiding they're yeah. like oh I love mm -hmm. you blah, blah. Yeah. and then motherfuckers stab you in the back the Roger Hedgecocks yeah the ones so that are like, I, I want to know exactly where you stand good I love you I know you're there yeah. but these fake ass California racists yeah. that are liberal and they'll fucking call the cops on you uh, like yeah. that's the shit that I'm <laughs> the not for Texas gun rack is intimidating right it although is. that is guns are always intimidating right that's why I always carry my 40 caliber and, but I did feel like making um, hu having a, joke, a humorous probably. conversation <laughs> <laughs> having a humorous conversation with this guy was I don't know if it's effective, but it was definitely on the route of being effective instead of me just being like, you fucking piece of shit, right. Klansman, which I felt that way, but I just right. need to say it. He already knew right. it. So yeah. anyhow. Well, I don't know how much yeah. other shit you want to cover, but everything. I really do feel like <laughs> I really appreciate you asking questions around mental health. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, that's why I work in now. I work in, in treatment, mental health. I work yeah. with people who are challenged with addiction. And I think music is a way to reach people. I think... Mm -hmm. Like uh, we were saying, like I have a uh, class that I do. I have my drum set in my therapy room. And sometimes instead of sitting in a formal, you know, therapist setting, we just go fucking hit the drums. That's yeah. sick. You know, we'll just, we'll do different ways of reaching the person because in, a, in the end, what we're doing is we're running from self, mm -hmm. right? That's for me when I was drinking and fucking using drugs and shit, I was running from self and now that I am in self and get to love myself mm. and and work on myself and have a beautiful wife and have a beautiful home and like i i love i love that i'm able to do this because i accept myself mm. and i think so much of um the people in our community that, that leave us in really sad ways is that we're trying to run from self it's interesting the the um <sighs> Oh, I don't even know what I was going to say that. You just threw me mm. for a loop on that one. Yeah. Fuck. Well, I think a lot of it, and the other thing too has been like my mindfulness practice. I really do a lot of that. Mm. I try to, you know, um, be aware, be more mindful. Yeah. Uh, again, well, another thing that fucking has been reappropriated by white people and their mm. fucking hippiness. Mm -hmm. But this shit, the Buddha was saying this shit 2,000 years ago, yeah. right? And, and now people want to make this whole thing about certain be cognitive behavioral therapies. Oh, yeah. But... But this shit was like being said thousands of years ago and yeah. was being practiced then. What about like people? I mean, I do I do wonder about like people that have uh, addictive personalities that, that that don't or that they either don't get into drugs and alcohol or did and, and changed to something else. Because right. music can I know people that are fully fucking addicted to like their craft and creating music yeah. in an addictive way but it's not destructive or self-destructive necessarily are you talking about luke i was thinking that <laughs> i, was I actually that. wasn't but fucking a man that yeah th there's one of them I no am. i was thinking about two other people and i'm not gonna name Him, them carlos but... too you're a de i get i get so addicted to working that like if i'm not here for yeah. two days i'm angry right like, ah, people will be yeah. like dude go to the studio yeah wow like, yeah. It's it's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't use addiction again. The definition of addiction is repetitive compulsive use of a substance or performance of a behavior that occurs despite negative consequences. Mm -hmm. And the part and part there is mm -hmm. is having negative consequences. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not having negative consequences, maybe you're OCD. Maybe you're something else. Yeah. But but I well, think what about when I'm a jerk to somebody? You know, well, you're just being like a fucking somebody jerk. Knows, yeah. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But in and, the ways where like. 
if he's not getting like, it. You I'm not understand. getting my music fix. Right. My studio well, when we fix, say addiction, so. there's an actual changing in terms of structure and function of brain. Like there's actually something that's been taking place that is beyond someone who, for example, engages in binge drinking. Doesn't mean that they're an addict, it's just they engage mm -hmm. in problematic drinking. The addiction is an actual diagnosable thing that you can actually take an assessment and say, yeah, we diagnose you with alcohol use disorder, here's some treatments for you, mm -hmm. so, so forth. For being an asshole, I don't know yeah. if there's treatment for being an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I don't think right? so. <laughs> <laughs> there are, but. There, yeah, there's a couple ways. I've been an asshole and I Same got here, bro. I get my ass kicked and not. Same fucking here. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I, we have to drive up to Oakland eight hours. I might be an asshole on the way up, you yeah. know, driving in a fucking car. You're a loving asshole, though. <laughs> yeah. you are, yeah. You've gone, we've gone through some yeah. stuff where I'm yeah, like, I love yeah, that yeah. guy. I, I love it, man. I, I'm so grateful that I was able to come down to San Diego and see all my friends, yeah. see you guys do this fucking interview. Um, life is short, man. As we can see, there's so many people that are dying these days. Fucking Pee Wee, rest in peace. Dude, uh, that's terrible. Uh, but I'm just, I think it's important to, to, to appreciate what we have. This is the thing I want to end on because I work with ex-lifers for a long time. These are people who did serious fucking time. The last guy I worked with had done 41 years, Whoa. 11 of those in the fucking hole. And he said to me, Jose, people don't really appreciate life until it's been taken from them. Of course. They don't appreciate things in, until it's been taken from you, until you've been put in a fucking cage for 41 years. When you get out, you really appreciate life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I really am, I really remember that. And Asada Shakur said, to be free, you have to be acutely aware of being a slave. And to me, when I was a slave to crack and alcohol and all that shit, literally, that's what led my life. And so in order for me to be free today and be clean and sober, I have to be acutely aware that at any point I could go back to that. Mm -hmm. So every day that I get, to be free and to ride home with my wife and fucking enjoy life. I'm, I'm fucking grateful, man. Yeah. I, I, it's beautiful, man. I mean, it is that like well, mindful awareness. Like it, it, it's such a, it seems like such a cheesy term now yeah. that's overused, but it, it's like, you know, like the people that get mad at getting cut off in a car. It's like, yeah. that's just a, a blip right. in nothingness. Like, <laughs> just go, do whatever. <laughs> just, it's fine. Just do whatever. It'll be yeah. fine. Again, I was that person. I know. <laughs> no, I know. No, but yoga actually helped me with a lot of that. I heard it you guys are doing that it shit. It's funny. Of... We go to the show. You guys wear the tight like... pants? I can't wait to <laughs> yeah. see that. We do, yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, what a hard We're matching though. ones. <laughs> <laughs> we have these like... Might it be yoga pants? <laughs> yeah, we have some outfits that we wear. <laughs> no, nice. it is funny though going to yoga and I'm like, I'll forget that I have some shirt on and I'll, they'll be like, nice shirt. And I'm like, what the fuck am I wearing? And, like, <laughs> and it says like, you know, pro abortion, anti Christ. And I'm like, oh, and they're like, no, it's awesome. And I'm like, right. Oh, maybe you guys are on the level. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> right on. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Um, thank you so yeah, much thank for you. letting me do this. Yeah, bro. I, love I love you guys. all you guys. This love is guys, fucking bro. cool. This is love really it. cool. Luke, be love San you, Diego. Love you, man. <laughs> I'm gonna hold you, bro. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh man, is this it? Yeah, that's oh, it. Good. It's hot as fuck. Cut. There. there you have it. Episode 31 of the Colton Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for chiming in. Um, Let's thank our sponsors as of now, Earthquaker Devices, who we absolutely love. love. You yep. should check out the podcast a few back that we had Julie and Jamie on. Um, Fender, Heartwork Coffee, you for uh, paying attention, listening, supporting. Um, we also like to thank Andy and Becky for all the ins and outs and making this stuff work. And... Um, Ruinous Media for uh, taking us on board, being part of their collective. Um, check out all of our other podcasts, please. Colton Culture is proudly sponsored by Earthquaker Devices, Fender, and Heartwork Coffee. Planet, Planet B. B. B.